preface, the past, the future. When will they return? I've been asked this question countless times by people who have read my books, the they being the Anunnaki, the extraterrestrials who have come to Earth from their planet Nibiru and who were revered in antiquity as gods. Will it be when Nibiru and its elongated orbit returns to our vicinity and what will happen then? Will, will there be darkness at noon and the Earth shall shatter? Will it be peace on Earth or Armageddon? A millennium of trouble and tri tribulations or a messianic second coming? Will it happen in 2012 or later or not at all? These are profound questions that combine people's deepest hopes and anxieties with religious beliefs and expectations. Questions compounded by current events, wars, and lands where the entwined affairs of gods and men began, the threats of nuclear holocausts, the alarming ferocity of natural disasters, they are questions that I dared not answer all these years, but now are questions the answers to which must not be delayed. Questions about the return, it ought to be realized, are not new. They have inexorably been linked to the past as they are today to the expectation and the apprehension of the day of the Lord, the end of days, Armageddon. Four millennia ago, the Near East witnessed a God and His Son promising heaven on earth. More than three millennia ago, king and people in Egypt yearned for a messianic time. Two millennia ago, the people of Judea wondered whether the Messiah had appeared, and we are still seized with the mysteries of those events. Are prophecies coming true? We shall deal with the puzzling answers that were given, solve ancient enigmas, decipher the origin and meanings of symbols, the cross, the fishes, the chalice, we shall describe the role of space-related sites in historic events and show why past, present, and future converge in Jerusalem, the place of the bond of heaven and earth. And we shall ponder why it is that our current 21st century A.D. is so similar to the 21st century B.C.E. Is history repeating itself? Is it destined to repeat itself? Is it all guided by a messianic clock? Is the time at hand? More than two millennia ago, Daniel of Old Testament fame repeatedly asked the angels when. When will be the end of days, the end of time? More than three centuries ago, the famed Sir Isaac Newton, was who elicited the secrets of celestial moons, composed treatises on the Old Testament's book of Daniel and the New Testament's book of Revelation. His recently found handwritten calculations concerning the end of days will be analyzed, along with more recent predictions of the end. Both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament asserted that the secrets of the future are embedded in the past, that the destiny of earth is connected to the heavens, that the affairs of, and fate of mankind are linked to those of God and God's. In dealing with what is yet to happen, we cross over from history to prophecy. One cannot be understood without the other, and we shall report them both. With that as our guide, let us look at what is to come through the lens of what has had what it had been. The answers will be certain to surprise. And that was the introduction there, Zachariah Sitch in New York, November 2006. Chapter number one, the messianic clock. Wherever one turns, humankind appears seized with apocalyptic trepidation, messianic fervor, and end time anxiety. Religious fanaticism manifests itself in wars, rebellions, and the slaughter of infidels. Armies amassed by kings of the West are warring with armies of the kings of the East. A clash of civilization shakes the foundations of traditional ways of life. Carnage engulfs cities and towns. The high and the mighty seek safety behind protective walls. Natural calamities and ever-intensifying catastrophes leave people wondering, has mankind sinned? Is it witnessing divine wrath? Is it due for another annihilating deluge? Is this the apocalypse? Can there be, will there be salvation? Are messianic times afoot? 
the, the time, the 21st century AD, or was it the 21st century BCE? The answer, it, correct, is yes and yes. Both in our own time as well as in those ancient times, it is the condition of the present time as well as at a time more than four millennia ago. And the amazing similarity is due to events in the middle time in between, the period associated with the messianic fervor at the time of Jesus. Those three cataclysmic periods for mankind and its planet, two in the recorded past, circa 2100, 2100 BCE and when BCE changed to AD, one in the nearing future are interconnected. One has led to the other. One can be understood only by understanding the other. The present stems from the past. The past is the future. Essential to all three is messianic expectation, and linking all three is prophecy. How the present time of troubles and tribulations will end, what the future portends, requires entering the realm of prophecy. Ours will not be a melange of newfound predictions whose main magnet is fear and of doom and end, but a reliance upon unique ancient records that documented the past, predicted the future, and recorded previous messianic expectations, prophesizing the future in antiquity, and one believes the future that is to come. In all three apocalyptic instances, the two that had occurred, the one that is about to happen, the physical and spiritual relationship between heaven and earth was and remains pivotal for the events. The physical aspects were expressed by the existence on earth of actual sites that linked earth with the heavens, sites that were deemed crucial, that were focuses of the events. The spiritual aspects have been expressed in what we call religion. In all three instances, a changed relationship between man and God was central, except that when circa 2100 BCE, mankind faced the first of these three apocal uh, upheavals, the relationship was between men and gods, in the plural, meaning more than one. Whether that relationship has really changed, the reader will soon discover. The story of the gods, the Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, as the Sumerians called them, begins with their coming to earth from Nibiru in need of gold. The story of their planet was told in antiquity in the Epic of Creation, a long text on seven tablets. It is usually considered to be an allegorical myth, the product of primitive minds that spoke of planets as living gods combating each other. But as I have shown in my book, The Twelfth Planet, the ancient text is in fact a sophisticated cosmology that tells how a stray planet passing by our solar system collided with a planet called Tiamat the collision resulted in the creation of Earth and its moon, of the asteroid belt and comets, and in the capture of the invader itself in a great elliptical orbit that takes about 3,600 years to complete. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's the whole uh, basis of, of Sitchin's work. Uh, uh, again, my, why he never talked about Vulcan is just a big question for me. Vulcan actually... Uh, said to have more of these effects. I don't know. I just I, I'm I'm down with the Sumerian stuff. I'm just not down with the whole Nibiru thing. I don't, I just don't believe in it. Uh, it was Sumerian texts tell 120 such orbits, 432 thousand Earth years prior to the deluge, the great flood that the Anunnaki came to Earth. How and why they came, their first cities in the Eden, the biblical Eden their fashioning of the atom and the reasons for it, and the events of the catastrophic deluge have all been told in the Earth Chronicle series of my books and will not be repeated here. But before we time travel to the momentous 21st century BCE, some pre-diluvial and post-diluvial landmark events need to be recalled. The biblical tale of the deluge, starting in chapter 6 of Genesis, describes its conflicting aspects to a sole deity, Yahweh who at first is determined to wipe mankind off the face of the earth and then goes out of his way to save it through Noah and the ark. Well, that's, a, yeah, that Yahweh is a common, they're, they're combining, uh, 
it's like it's like they're combining Enlil and, and, and Inky together into one into one thing because of course Inky created mankind, felt com- had compassion for them. Enlil wanted them wiped out, and uh, Inky had compassion and created the Ark and saved them. The earlier Sumerian sources of the tale ascribed the disaffection with mankind to the god Enlil and the counter effort to save mankind to the god Enki. What the Bible glossed over for the sake of monotheism was not just the disagreement between Enlil and Enki, but a rivalry and a conflict between two clans of Anunnaki that dominated the course of subsequent events on Earth. The conflict between the two and their offspring and the Earth religions allocated to them after the deluge need to be kept in mind to understand all that happened thereafter. The two were half-brothers, sons of Nibiru's ruler Anu. Their conflict on Earth had its roots on their home planet, Nibiru. Enki, then called Ea, whose home, he whose home is water, or, yeah, you know, that's exactly. Well, that's what our, most of our planet's made of. That's why Earth, E-A-R-T-H, the realm of Ea, that's what the Earth means was a new's firstborn son, but not the official spouse, Antu. When Enlil was born to Anu by Antu, a half-sister of Anu, Enlil became the legal heir to Nibiru's throne, though he was not the firstborn son. The unavoidable resentment on the part of Enki and his maternal family was exacerbated by the fact that Anu's accession to the throne was problematic to begin with. Having lost out in a succession struggle to a rival named Alalu, he later usurped the throne in a coup d'etat, forcing Alalu to flee Nibiru for his life. That not only backtracked Ea's resentments to the days of his forebears, but also brought about other challenges to the leadership of Enlil, as told in the epic tale of Anzu. For the tangled relationships of Nibiru's royal families and the ancestries of Anu and Antu, Enlil and Ea see the lost book of Enki, or better yet, listen to my reading of it on YouTube. The key to unlocking the mystery of the gods' succession in marriage rules was my realization that these rules also apply to the people chosen by them to serve as their proxies to mankind. Well, yep, that's, that, that's where the bloodlines come in. It was the biblical tale of the patriarch Abraham in Genesis 20.12. Isn't that interesting? Genesis 20.12. The book of Genesis chapter... 20 verse 12, that he did not lie when he had presented his wife Sarah as his sister. Indeed, she is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Not only was marrying a half sister from a different mother permitted, but a son by her, in this case, Isaac, became the first legal heir and dynastic successor rather than the firstborn Ishmael, the son of a handmaiden of the handmaiden Hagar. How such secession rules caused the bitter feud between Ra's divine descendants in Egypt, the half-brothers Osiris and Seth, who married the half-sisters Isis and Nephetis, is explained in the Wars of Gods and Men. Though those succession rules appear complex, they were based on those who write about royal dynasties and, and what and I'm sorry. They were based on what those who write about royal dynasties call bloodlines. What we now should recognize as sophisticated DNA genealogies that also distinguish between general DNA inherited from the parents as well as the mitochondrial DNA that is inherited by females only from the mother. The complex yet basic rule was this. Dynastic lines continue through the male line. The firstborn son is the next in succession. A half-sister could be taken as a wife if she had a different mother, and if a son by such, a half-sister is later born, that son, though not firstborn, becomes the legal heir and the dynastic successor. The rivalry between the two half-brothers, Ea and Enki and Enlil, in matters of the throne was complicated by personal rivalry in matters of the heart. They both coveted their half-sister Ninma, whose mother was yet another concubine of Anu. She was Ea's true love, but he was not permitted to marry her. Enlil then took over and had a son by her, Ninurta. Though born without wedlock, the secession rules made Ninurta Enlil's uncontested heir, 
being both the, his firstborn son and one born by a royal half-sister. Ea, as related in the Earth Chronicles book, was the leader of the first group of 50 Anunnaki to come to Earth to obtain the gold needed to protect Nibiru's dwindling atmosphere. When the initial plans failed, his half-brother Enlil was sent to Earth with more Anunnaki for an expanded mission. If that was not enough to create a hostile atmosphere, Ninma too arrived on Earth to serve as chief medical officer. A long text known as the Atreus Epic begins the story of gods and men on Earth with a visit by Anu to Earth to settle once and for all, he hoped, the rivalry between his two sons, and that was ruining the vital mission. He even offered to stay on Earth and let one of the half-brothers assume the regency on Nibiru. With that in mind, the ancient texts tell us lots were drawn to determine who would stay on Earth and who would sit on Nibiru's throne. The result of drawing lots, then, was that Anu returned to Nibiru as its king, Ea, given dominion over the seas and waters. In later times, Ea was known as Poseidon to the Greeks and Neptune to the Romans. He was granted the epitaph Enki, the lord of the earth, to soothe his feelings, but it was Enlil, lord of the command, who was put in overall charge. To him, the earth was made subject, resentful or not, Ea and Enki could not defy the rules of secession or the results of the drawing of lots. And so the resentment, the anger at justice denied, and a consuming determination to avenge injustices to his father and forefathers, and thus to himself, led Enki's son Marduk to take up the fight. Several texts describe how the Anunnaki set up their settlements in the Eden, the post-diluvial Sumer, each with a specific function and all laid out in accordance with a master plan. The crucial space connection, the ability to constantly stay in communication with the home planet and with the shuttlecraft and spacecraft, was maintained from Enlil's command post in Nippur, the heart of which was a dimly lit chamber called the Duranki, the bond of heaven and earth. Yeah, the bond of it, that's a, that's a stargate. Another vital facility was a spaceport located at Sipar, the bird city. Yeah, where they land their fucking Klingon bird of praise at. Zita! So! Ah! Nippur lay at the center of concentric circles with each other, where the cities of the gods were located. Altogether, they shaped out for an arriving spacecraft, a landing corridor whose focal point was the Near East's most visible topographic feature, the twin peaks of Mount Ararat. And then the deluge swept over the Earth, obliterated all the cities of the gods, with their mission control center and spaceport, and buried the Eden under millions of tons of mud and silt. Everything had to be done all over again, but much could no longer be the same. First and foremost, it was necessary to create a new spaceport, spaceport facility with a new mission control center and new beacon sites for a landing corridor. The new landing path was anchored again on the prominent twin peaks of Ararat. The other components were all new, the actual spaceport, in the Sinai Peninsula on the 30th parallel north, artificial twin beacon peaks as beacon sites, the Giza pyramids, and a new mission control center at a place called Jerusalem. It was a layout that played a crucial ro role in post-diluvial events. The deluge was a watershed in the affairs of both gods and men, and in the relationship between the two. The earthlings who were fashioned to serve and work for the gods were henceforth treated as junior partners on a devastated planet. The new relationship between men and gods was formulated, sanctified, and codified when mankind was granted its first high civilization in Mesopotamia circa 3800 BCE. The momentous event followed a state visit to Earth by Anu, not just as Nibiru's ruler, but also as the head of the pantheon on Earth of the ancient gods. Another and probably the main reason for his visit was the establishment and affirmation of peace among the gods themselves, a live and let live arrangement dividing the lands of the old world among the two principal Anunnaki clans, that of Enlil and that of Enki for the new post-diluvial circumstances and the new location of the space facilities required a new territorial division among the gods. It was a division that was reflected in the biblical table of nations. Genesis chapter 10, in which 
The spread of mankind emanating from the three sons of Noah was recorded by nationality and geography. Asia to the nations, lands of Shem, Europe to the descendants of Japhet, Africa to the nation and lands of Ham. The historical records show that the parallel division among the gods allotted the first two to the Enlilites, the third one to Enki and his sons. The connecting Sinai Peninsula, where the vital post-alluvial spaceport was located, was set aside as a, as a neutral sacred region. And uh, that's the reason why those are considered the, the, the you know, the, the holy lands and stuff, folks. That's where the fucking aliens landed. Come on. While the Bible simply listed the lands and nations according to their Noahite division, the earlier Sumerian text recorded the fact that the division was a deliberate act. The result of deliberations by the leadership of the Anunnaki, a text known as the Epic of Atana, tells us that the great Anunnaki who decree the fates sat exchanging their counsels regarding the earth. They created the four regions and set up the settlements. In the first region, the land between the two rivers, Euphrates and the Tigris, Mesopotamia, man's first known high civilization, that of Samir, was established. Where the pre-diluvial cities of the gods had been, cities of man arose, each with its sacred precinct where a deity resided in his or her ziggurat. In Lil, in Dapur, Ninma, in Shiparak, Ninurta, in Lagash, Nenar, Sin, in Ur, so on and so on, in each such urban center, an Ensi, a righteous shepherd, initially a chosen demigod, was selected to govern the people in behalf of the gods. His main assignment was to promulgate codes of justice and morality in the sacred precinct, a priesthood overseen by a high priest served the god and his spouse supervised the holiday celebrations and handled the rites of offerings, sacrifices, and prayers to the gods. Art and sculpture, music and dance, poetry and hymns, and above all, writing and record-keeping flourished in the temples and extended to the royal place. Uh, the royal palace, rather. From time to time, one of those cities was selected to serve as the land's capital. There the ruler was king, Lugal, the great man. Initially and for a long time thereafter, this person, the most powerful man in the land, served as both king and high priest. He was carefully chosen for his role and authority, and all the physical symbols of kingship were deemed to have come to earth directly from heaven, from a new Nibiru. A Sumerian text dealing with the subject stated that before the symbols of kingship, the tiara, the crown, and the scepter, and of righteousness, the shepherd's staff, were granted to an earthly king, they lay deposited before Anu in heaven. Indeed, the Sumerian word for kingship was Anu ship. The aspect of kingship as the essence of civilization, just behavior, and a moral code for mankind was explicitly expressed in the statement in the Sumerian king list that after the deluge, kingship was brought down from heaven. It was a profound statement that must be borne in mind as we progress in this book to the messianic expectations in the words of the New Testament for the return of the kingship of heaven to earth. And uh, we are going to... Stop right there on that part of the uh, of the book that is. Let's see. Yeah, but just bookmark that there. All right, and we will pick up on that next time on the broadcast. Good stuff there in our new series of reading, and uh, we will be getting into more of that next time on the show. Not going to be a live show tomorrow night because I'm going to be on with Lee Rogers for three hours, 9 to midnight Central Standard Time, oraclebroadcasting.com, three-hour throwdown. Rogers Reeves, I hope you'll join us. I also hope you'll donate my website, thegoldmorality.com, support what we do, keep us commercial-free, uncensored, and pushing forward, and uh, help me to continue to uh, get out some real information to con uh, combat what these fucking ass clowns and the phonies and the patriot movement truth movement are doing man i can't do it without you and uh, i'm just a one-man operation so 
any help we get is greatly appreciated, folks. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and being here with us tonight. TheGlobalReality.com. Get yourself a copy of uh, Secret Right Volume 2 on Blu-ray or DVD as well. My name is Josh Reeves. I love each and every one of you, and you guys have yourselves a great one. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.